Hello, hello everyone. My name is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO of Product School. And today I'm here with a very special guest. Her name is Joanna Wolverton. She's the executive vice president at of product at Zendesk. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining the show. Can't wait to learn more about your own personal story that brought you to product, but also know a bit more about how you think about product and, and what you think is next for, for everyone in the industry. Perfect. <laughs> so let's get things started. Like, why don't you tell us a bit more about, about yourself? It feels like an interview, but I just want to dive a little deeper into the product world. Like, what is an EVP of product and what, you know, how do you make it happen? Yeah, uh, I think it's one of the most interesting things about this sort of field of product management to me is that there isn't, you know, a well-worn path to this place. Um, and my career definitely is a reflection of that. I, I got my degree from university in uh, political science and Russian studies. And as my mom likes to remind me, I was qualified to do nothing. You should have been a doctor. Why didn't you be a doctor? Anyway, here we are. Um, so um, I, I fell into an interesting corner of software product development localization um, because I had a sort of language affinity. What it gave me the opportunity to do was really get this fascinating view into how software was developed. It never occurred to me. Um, and getting in the guts and running builds and understanding UI. And I was like, oh, this is cool. And uh, got really lucky uh, because it was the first dot com boom and I lived in the Bay Area. And I started uh, helping marketing departments build the first sort of rudimentary websites. And one of those websites sort of morphed itself into a product and they suggested that I might want to be the product manager. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. I was in a place where I was like, sure, yes, sounds great. And as soon as I started doing that job, it was like, oh, this, this is amazing. Um, I, I really, really like started to super thrive in that job. And then, you know, almost immediately the dot-com bust happened um, and there were a whole bunch of people who had actually been product managers longer than 18 months uh, who were out on the job market. Uh, but I got lucky and um, uh, one of the guys who worked on my engineering team when I was the product manager was at Salesforce and called me and asked if I wanted to do localization again, which I definitely did not want to do. Um, but it got me in the door. And from there, uh, interestingly, there was a glitch in the in the case management system. And I used to get product bugs routed to me. And I was so terrified that I was gonna screw up and do the wrong thing that I just started reproducing them and figuring out how to fix them. And then I would go to developers and ask them to, to check it in for me. And, and finally, they were like, Shana, please stop harassing our engineers. We'll give you a team. So when, when, you, when you got those first jobs, like who did product managers report to? I reported to the CMO in my first job. And then as soon as I, and then once I got uh, into Salesforce and, and, you know, the sort of chaos of that early product development explosion that was happening everywhere um, and into more of a sort of professionalism, um, there was a head of product and engineering. Interesting. Another thing that I think it's, it's, it's cute uh, for me to kind of curiosity. Like you, you don't come from an engineering background, like traditional computer science. How many non-engineers were there in the product team? You know, back in the day. Yeah, not a lot. But I think you know, um, we talked about a little this about before. That I think it's one of the biggest misconceptions about what it takes to be a great product manager is that you have some kind of deep, deep technical expertise, and what. I hooked into very early was um, about wanting to make customers happy. And like, that's the fire in my gut is like, I want to delight customers. I want to give them a thing that they love using. And, you know, with curiosity and relationship building, um, you know, it was, it was never ever an issue for me, even in my multiple years of working, you know, on technical platform things that, uh, you know, I couldn't code my way out of a wet paper bag. And, and I think that's a good inspiration for, for the next generation of product leaders to know that you don't have to be this standard, you know, 
whatever someone, your parents told you, you have to study. And then the more people get to leadership positions that don't come from traditional backgrounds, the more they can encourage others to make it happen. So what is it that, you know, how do you supplement, the, I would say, the lack of technical skills in order to prove and continue proving that, you know, you can lead products from end to end? Yeah, I mean, I think so much of it is about how you build relationships with the people on your team and then across an organization. I think fundamentally this job, for as much as we often, because the output is software, we think of it as a technical job, but it's actually, it's just such a relentless people job. And you don't, you don't get to tell anyone what to do. All you can do is sort of try to, you know, tell a really good story and try to get everyone to come with you. And, um, you know, that, that it took me a while, I think, to realize that I was my early, I was like in all the bugs and I was trying to understand what was happening. You know, I learned more and more over the years. I learned more and more about how to talk to developers when I knew they were like being straight with me and when, you know, maybe not so much <laughs> and, and sort of how to, um, have those conversations and talk about outcomes. Um, and then and then I think it's, you know, wins on the board, right? Say you're going to do a thing, do the thing, tell everyone you did the thing. And sooner uh, rather than later, people start giving you more things to do. Definitely. And now we see that product is not part of marketing or part of technology. It's its own function. And, and you as an EVP of product, you lead that agenda. So can you give us an idea, a status of like, you know, how does product work at Zendesk? Well, it's a really interesting setup at Zendesk. Um, through acquisition and sort of some organic growth, we have product development teams in 11 countries, 12? Yeah, we had Canada. So from Krakow to Singapore, we are doing product development <laughs> almost 24 hours a day um, and, you know, trying to figure out how we coordinate across all of the time zones, how we collaborate across all of the time zones has been um, one of the most interesting parts of my now two year journey so far at Zendesk. And um, what's interesting is that it sort of necessitates a, uh, a balance between some strong top down directives and then a lot of trust in the bottoms up that's happening in the regions, right? I'm not sitting next to the product team in Singapore and sort of understanding their day to day. Uh, and I have to give them a strong sense of where we're going from a North Star point of view, from a big picture, high level, these are the most important things for the next half, for the next year, for the next 18 months. And then trust that that when they have to make decisions day to day without me or even one of my directs uh, in their time zone, that they're, they have the information they need to do it. That's so fascinating to me because when I, I we still use Zendesk, but when I first used the product so many years ago, it was pretty much a help desk, help desk tool. Yep. Now it scaled to an entire platform to cover so many different use cases. And then you mentioned that you, Part of that was through acquisitions. So when you when you acquire a smaller organization that brings their own culture and ways of working together, and now you have this huge org that has to play the same the same music. How do you go about building a culture that, that scales? Yeah, it's um, it's hard work. It takes a lot of intention, right? I think I arrived and all of these different people and all these different places were working on very specific things, and there was very, very little thought to how they would all come together in a single experience. They were sold separately, they were used separately, and it became clear that for a, you know, a really great agent experience, when you wanna be helping your customers, going to four or five different products and trying to figure out yourself how to string them together was inefficient. So we had to get the whole organization thinking about how what they're doing contributes to a whole. And I kind of thought if I just started saying it over and over again, <laughs> that was sufficient. Um, and it turns out um, it takes a lot, a lot more effort. And it took, um, you know, a lot of setting um, some centralized 
big vision, big bet uh, stuff. It took some really strong program management staff to help us sort of connect dots. And then it took uh, me sort of, you know, every time I saw it, making sure, um, you know, I was celebrating those kinds of wins and um, really um, getting, you know, showing everyone sort of how that can work. Um, we've had this year has been terrible. Let's make no mistake for everyone, but it's been an interesting leveling of the playing field and um, the, the amount of cross team collaboration that has happened um, has, has really uh, pleasantly surprised me. I'm incredibly proud of my team. So how does your day to day look like? I'm very curious because, you know, in startup worlds, a v everyone is a VP of product. <laughs> But when you are at that size of a company, being an EVP, it's a whole different game, and especially with the complexity that you just mentioned with different time zones, different products. So let's say you wake up in the morning or like, you know, what's your plan for the week? How do you make sure that, you know, nothing fall or the most important things don't fall through the crack? <laughs> well, I have a fantastic staff of people who help. Like, <laughs> Shauna, remember. Hey, Shauna, remember it's this thing. Um, uh, but... Uh, in honesty, my day is, is almost 100% meetings, um, and it's about 50% meetings um, kind of inside of my product organization, um, and then the rest is sort of taking product out into the world, making sure we're aligned um, with the leadership in product marketing, making sure we're aligned with our go-to-market partners in sales, with success, having, you know... Um, deep conversations with, uh, with customers. Um, I'm involved in quite a few uh, executive sponsor relationships and then also I'm often called in um, if there's some kind of escalation. Um, we have you know, sort of the regular cadence of executive staff meetings. Uh, then there's some um, you know, meetings to get work done. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, but it's a lot, a lot of meetings. I um, I feel really strongly that uh, time spent with people on my team is is great. So I have one-on-ones with my team. I have one-on-ones with their directs on a regular basis, and I have um, quite a few sort of uh, double down, uh, kind of two layers, three layers down one-on-ones um, on a regular basis especially when you know we're not seeing each other in the hallway. I want to make sure everyone on my team feels like they have what they need to get their job done and, and are having a good time. So I'm, I'm very curious about that because we get a lot of people that are either fighting to break into product or they're already working in product. And they start asking about the career path. Because we talk a lot about how to break into product, but then what? Like nobody told us what the options really are. And, and I can totally see a people manager path as you described, with literally spending a lot of time with others in meetings. But what about people who just love building, getting their hands dirty and being kind of in the front line with engineers and designers? How can they grow? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the first thing is to join a company that has a culture of strong uh, individual contributor PMs and, and understand, you know, is there a parallel career ladder that they've written down this is really important to me. I was an accidental manager. I was, you know, I was in charge of three scrum teams. I was having a great time. Uh, and I had a boss who pulled me into a conference room and said, okay, these two guys, they report to you now go. And that was my management training. Um, <laughs> and I luckily found out that I loved it. I absolutely got such a thrill out of the success of those two guys that I mean, it was, I felt better about what they did than anything I had ever done. So uh, I love management. I know that not everyone should be a management a manager. I know that being a manager and a product leader is an entirely different job than being a product manager. So if you love product managing, uh, don't, don't follow in my footsteps. I don't get to product manage anymore. It's really sad. I miss it. My, I, I keep threatening to get a whiteboard behind me and I'll like a whiteboard and they're like, no, <laughs> but, you know, it's it's funny because from the outside, being a product manager, that's a matter of title, like be working in product so, sounds so cool. And everyone's like, oh my God, I want to do it. Because I think the misconception sometimes is that you are in this room 
calling the shots, having these big ideas, but it's so the opposite, you know, and there are so many people cranking that are like, oh my God, what do I get myself into? Yeah, I like to say that this is ostensibly, like if you did an objective inventory, it's one of the worst jobs ever, right? I mean, I think if if everything goes perfectly and you have an amazing launch and customers love the thing you did, you're up on stage thanking the multitudes, your engineers and your program team and your marketing team and your go-to-market and the whole world gets thanked. And if it absolutely flops, you're up on that stage all alone and all you can do is it's entirely my fault. I'm sorry. I think I, think I figured out what happened and I will make sure we don't have that happen again. So um, it is... I tell people like you have to find the fire in your gut about why you want to sort of walk through this particular fire. Um, uh, you know, the joke I have with a lot of my peers is that if there was something else we were good at, we probably would have done it, but like, we can't imagine ourselves doing anything else. I completely agree with you. I think there is something inside about just, just learning and pushing and trying and, you know, like breaking things a little bit, but not too much. Uh, but at the same time, I think recognizing that when things go well, it's not about you. And when things don't go so well, you definitely have to take responsibility. Uh, in a way, it feels very similar to what a CEO or other executives need to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, in this role, I, if, when I'm being generous, I, I like to say that I'm the product manager of the product management organization. So sort of understanding what I want the outcomes to be and how do we get there from where we are? What are the processes, the org structure, um, all of those kinds of things. And I think as a CEO, you're sort of that for the company. And uh, how do you, so I'm very also very curious about learning in general. Like you, you mentioned how you accidentally broke into product. Someone gave you the title and you accidentally became a manager. And, but you've been growing and, and leading larger and larger teams. So how can someone like really learn on the go or not on the go, but make sure that you can acquire the, the, the necessary skills to continue being at that, at that level and not become a bottleneck for everybody? Yeah, I mean, I'm very much an experiential learner, but the few places, the, the places I really invested from an educational point of view um, were not so much in the mechanics, because I think sort of the mechanics are vaguely the same, but different enough everywhere that usually someone, you get to a place and you learn their way of doing it and you go. Um, I think one of the most important skills that's so often overlooked for product managers is uh, communication written communication, uh, the ability to build a great presentation and tell your story and to do that um, in a way where you have confidence and you can absolutely be ready uh, for whatever sort of comes at you. I think, um, you know, what I've seen over and over again in organizations is that PMs maybe who don't even deliver as like there might be some, there's two PMs. One is heads down, delivering great features over and over and over again. And one is like, eh, fine, you know, they're sort of, they'll be in delivery, but they are amazing at telling their story in front of an audience. And this person wins. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important um, to, I, I love the, when they're both, it's best, but I think, um, you know, the business sort of uh, will always, um, reward and gravitate the people who can talk about the work that they're doing and frame it in terms of how it impacts the business. I agree with you. I We, we have two types of um, students for the most part. One are engineers who don't want to code anymore. And then they're one of the business folks who want to be closer to the action. Yeah. They don't know how to code. They don't have zero intention in, in learning. So, But I've seen so many amazing engineers who are much better than what they, they can imagine. And they just need to kind of treat themselves as a product and put themselves out there. And they just need to push them and like, come on, like you, you, you know what you're talking about? Like you are amazing. It's, like, it's just hard for someone to, to find out unless you tell them. And I've seen the opposite as well. Yeah, and it's a muscle, right? I mean, I, I remember uh, like it was yesterday, my first sprint review and the executive staff were sitting in the audience and I knew that if I misspoke or said something that was disagreeable, I was 
I, it was going to hurt. <laughs> and, and, um, you know, I was nauseous. I, my mouth got dry. Um, and you know, it was just with, uh, repetition. And then, you know, every time there was an opportunity to get up and talk for as terrified as I was, or as uncertain as I was about my ability to do that, just saying yes and doing it over and over and over. I did my first year when I started doing executive briefings, I did 53 of them in a year. And uh, by the, like the first one, I was sitting at my desk sweating, trying to put slides together, like, oh God, how is this gonna go? And by the last one, I think I was like two seconds before the EBC, I was in the lobby like, oh yeah, bloop, bloop, walking in, like, we got this, let's go. So it really is just doing it. Definitely. Um... I can't agree more. I, I know that traditionally, obviously in product, there's a lot of times we have to say no uh, just to prioritize. And, and I g totally get and respect that part. But I think there's another part of just putting yourself in an uncomfortable position. There's no replacement for that. No. And, and there's a tremendous amount. I mean, I think we were all, it's drilled into us to say no and to, to, to you have to say no. If everything's important, nothing's important but there's a tremendous power in saying yes. Um, and being able, I mean, we know so much and we are connected so well in organizations. And I think um, there's a tremendous amount of um, benefit to us and to our companies when we take the time to you know, give other people access to that network that we've created sort of just in the course of doing our jobs. All right, so let's talk about diversity and in general how you go about building teams we we know that it's not just about engineers anymore we know that diverse teams that build for everyone usually win but you specifically do you have any any playbook or way of building your own team yeah i mean i think you know it's it's really important to have an alignment with your recruiting organization and to be really clear with your recruiting organization about um you know the kinds of slates that you want um, in your candidates. I think one of my favorite things to do is to take people who have not been PMs before um, and bring them into junior roles. I think um, there is a tremendous amount of talent out there that maybe doesn't even know that they would be great at this. And uh, I always have my eye out. Um, engineering managers have become very suspect of me when I ask about their <laughs> engineers <laughs> like ah, how's that how are they doing any you think they might be getting bored of doing that coding thing over there <laughs> um because i think uh you know when you've been doing this as long as i have you sort of get a sense so i think it's about intention um i think it's about it it's a virtuous circle right when you have women who are in uh, your leadership of the company in leadership in product and engineering, you just, uh, it's like a magnet. M more women show up to apply, more women stick around, more women grow. Um, and then I think, you know, we have to start thinking beyond, right? If there um, is tremendous uh, talent in, in across uh, race and culture and, um, you know, again, working with your recruiting teams Building up partnerships, we have a fantastic partnership. I just did uh, speed mentoring with uh, a whole cohort from Black Girls Code. There is so much young talent out there, and uh, you just we just have to expose ourselves to it. There is no pipeline problem. There's just a hiring problem. I, I agree. Um, I always tell this to a lot of our students to to ask internally first of all, because there are a lot of companies that really want to give the opportunity to someone, even if they don't have the official title. Yep. And, and also, I think in terms of diversity, it's such a, for me, I think it starts from the root. I just don't believe in a situation of like, oh my God, we have too many, whatever. We just need to suddenly start hiring a different type of profile. I think it starts from like really building that culture and, and showing that this is not just for show. This is because it's better for the company. This is better for your clients and ultimately better for the world. Yeah. And I think if you make, your organization a great place to work for everyone you are going to get a whole bunch of of different people that might not have come to begin with right i mean i think 
uh, cultures that are relentless and like crazy mean or yelly, right? If you're a mom with a new kid, like you don't want to deal with that and you're going to go somewhere else, right? Inflexibility. Like I can't take time off in the afternoon. I've got a culture where everyone has to be online all the time. Uh, you know, you've got a whole bunch of people who maybe are taking care of parents or, and, and so I think there's a, like a rising, the tide for all of the boats that comes when you really think about the people who work for you as people and instead of as resources um, and, and create that kind of culture in your organization. It's uh, like I said, it's in a, it attracts all kinds of great people. So when you are leading a, a portfolio of products, how do you go about really building what's next? Because it's not just one single roadmap. I can imagine you have like so many different things going on at the same time. So getting consensus is not the same as it used to be five people in the same room. Like, hey, what do you think? Cool, let's do it. Yeah. Um, we recently uh, created a new process uh, and it, it kicks off actually this afternoon. It's my one of my meetings this afternoon. We do uh, a sort of high level team by team roadmap refresh where we look out three quarters and you know, next quarter we got a pretty good idea that these are definitely the things we're gonna deliver. The second one, you're like, yep, pretty much. That third one's like, eh, who knows what will happen by then. And we, uh, every quarter do an update. So rather than sort of starting the year and saying, this is what we're going to do for the year. And then despite whatever happens, we just keep marching. We're really trying to get more agile. Um, and then I do that review with uh, everyone all around the world. Uh, we'll be done with those by the end of next week. And then every month, uh, and I don't know how, like, it's not particularly scalable, but I love it too much to stop. Um, we do a scrum team by scrum team sprint review where not, it's not really a sprint, but it's the spirit of it. Like, this is what we were going to do on that big plan for this month. Here's what we thought we were going to do. Here's what we got done. And, and here's a demo. And it keeps me connected um, to all the teams. It, it allows a whole bunch of you know me and my staff to to understand what's happening, not just you know in their own orgs, but across um, and and spot stuff that might be getting weird. <laughs> um, and uh, it it really helps us sort of keep a, a pulse check on all the stuff that's going on. And I'm I'm glad you brought this up because I know that according to agile principles. There are certain things that you know you shouldn't do, but the reality is things happen, and and sometimes you just need to be extra involved in something, and that doesn't mean being a micromanager. It's just that you want to make sure that you know people get it, and especially in such a large team. Yeah, I mean, like I think I talked about it earlier, right? I mean, as especially as you come up and and are overseeing more and more, you have all of this great sort of you know fiber that you've laid all over the organization and and when you're constantly sort of going in and looking at all of these things like the connections it's hard for someone down in the bottom of the organization to understand especially you know they're in singapore someone's in krakow but when you see both of those things and go oh my gosh you guys are building something really similar maybe you should talk and you could build a service and and we could have one of these instead of two um it's it's one of the fun parts of my role. And like I said, you know, when we're twice the size, it's hard to imagine. Uh, I'll still be doing monthly sprint reviews, but uh, I hope I can manage. So yes, my last question for you is, um, how are you thinking about the, the future? What do you think are the biggest opportunities for, for people who are involved in building digital products? I mean, there's, we are in an amazing time of, uh, you know, growth and there are so many companies growing so fast who need uh, product people to come in and help them. Um, you know, CEO founders can only run product for so long before weird stuff starts happening. And I think, um, you know, every everything from startups to megacorps are looking for people who can come in and and sort of figure out how things work there and, and get to building. Um, so I'm super excited about the role and the future of who's becoming product managers. I think, you know, this idea really does seem to be taking root that, that it's not a job that has, 
you know, entrance requirements or, uh, you know, I think we're well past this. I have to be an MBA to be a product manager and, and sort of opening of, of gates for all kinds of people to come into this role. Uh, I am very bullish on the future of product management and product managers. Me too. Well, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Of course. Likewise.